a start. So hello and welcome to everyone who is joining us today. My name is Dr Jasmine Cooper and I'm a research associate at Imperial College London and I'll be the chair for today's seminar. So before I hand over to Dr Lee Shen, who'll be giving her presentation, just a few quick words on housekeeping and a bit of an introduction to the Imperial Lifecycle Network. So this session is being recorded and a copy of the slides will be made available to the registered attendees after the seminar. As it is being recorded, please do mute your microphones and switch off your camera so that we can save bandwidth. There will, be, there will be the opportunity for Q&A at the end, and as we have a very large number of attendees, we're going to ask that if you have any questions, can you please type these into the chat and we'll go through these questions at the end. If you require uh, audio captioning, these are available in Microsoft Teams. You just need to click on the icon that has three little dots and then select the option to enable live captioning if you require that. So now just a little bit of information about the Imperial Lifecycle Network and our seminar series in general. So the Imperial Lifecycle Network is a network based at Imperial, which aims to bring together and connect lifecycle related research and researchers across Imperial as well as the wider lifecycle community. The purpose of the network is to foster collaborations and facilitate networking, as well as to share knowledge and contribute towards advancements within the lifecycle field. For more information about the network, uh, visit our website, follow us on Twitter, and for any UK-based LCA practitioners, consider joining the Lifecycle Community UK group on LinkedIn. So today's seminar is the first seminar of 2023 and is the 10th seminar that we've had the privilege of hosting. Um, on the screen, you see a selection of some of our past seminars. Um, recordings and all slides from all of our past seminars are available on our website, so do check those out. There's kind of a variety of different speakers and topics covered. Now moving on to today's speaker. So today the network is very happy to be able to present Dr. Lee Shen from Utrecht University, who'll be giving a presentation titled Alternative Carbon Sources for Plastic, a Circular Bio-Based Plastics a Solution. So Dr. Li Shen is an assistant professor at the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development in Utrecht University. She was a mechanical engineer by training, but was attracted by the interactions between material slash energy systems and the environment. So became a LCA practitioner a decade ago. Her research keywords are technology assessment, circular assessment, plastics, bio-based chemicals and plastics plastics recycling, and recently uh, CO2-based chemicals. She is a teacher in the Energy Science Materials Programme, where she teaches research methods and tools in the course Advanced Energy Systems. And with that, Dr. Uh, Li Shen, I will hand over to you when I figure out how to stop sharing my screen. Oh, there it is. Yeah, over to you. Thank you, I will share my screen. Um... I assume you can all see this, but I will. Yes, you can see that. Super. Thanks for the yes. thanks for the introduction, and I don't have to introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> I am um, I'm an LCA practitioner, so uh, I was asked by Jasmine to talk about my research, and my research has uh, largely around the topic of plastics. So the topic today is uh, whether circular bio-based plastics is a solution for us. Um, as I said, plastics is my topic and the plastics is a Greek word. And, and if you look at original meaning of the, the word, it has nothing really to do with petrochemical and crude oil. It means that something that is easy to process, to shape and to form. And I borrowed this picture from National Museum of Ireland. Um, it's an it's a animal horn uh, that, is, that was heated up and shaped into a form of spoon. So we have been using this property of plastics in for a long time before we understand the chemical property, the chemical structure of, of the natural polymer. So we also have been using natural resin for coating wood and fibers for, for, for heating and for textile for longer history in our civilization. Up until 1800, um, we start to realize that the Industrial Revolution actually promoted a lot of innovation around the wood-based uh, chemistry. And celluloid, for example, obsolete ivory in 1870s, that's a very big 
invention at the time, right? And Viscose invented also at the same time and at the, had in mind at the time, the invention is to replace cotton and silk. And still we can find these products today. And funny enough that I um, also discovered the first Lego was also bio-based from cellulose acetate. Um, of course, all these, some of those uh, survived also along the history. And for example, cellophane was sometimes still find those uh, cellophane for films and used for candy wrapping and it's transparent. It looks like synthetic um, plastic film. Um, and historical picture from, I borrowed it from Bloomberg, is uh, Mr. Henry Ford. He started a project in 1920s. He had ambition to build a car that is made from soybean. <laughs> also use a uh, few straw, hemp and flax to, to do the reinforcement. And this car even can run on um, corn ethanol. So he had envisioned the bio-based economy long, long time ago, a hundred years ago. This project never survived. So it slowly died out in, in the forties because in 1930s, we found um, crude oil and there was worldwide large oil extraction and for primarily for yeah, refinery and for transportation, but we got a lot of NAFTA. What do we do with that? In the in between the 30s and the 50s, there's a lot of invention on, on commercialization of different plastics that we use today. Uh, so PVC, PS, and, and a lot of polyolefins and polyesters were all invented in that period of time. If you look at the historical statistics, the global annual plastic production in the 50s, that was already about 2 million tons. I remember that number. And how much do we produce today? How did we come to this point? <laughs> we today we produce about 300 to 400 millimetric tons synthetic polymers every year, and this number is still growing. And plastics is a very convenient, right? They they are everywhere in our life, but they are also problematic. So producing of plastics requires um, fossil fuels. We all know it also emits a lot of greenhouse gas. So if I if we look at this whole map of global greenhouse gas emissions and looking at the chemical and the petrochemical sector and also oil and gas refinery extraction sector, these two sector together contributes to about nine to 10 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. And a large part actually attributes to the plastic that we demand on a daily basis. And the picture on the right is even more drastic to see that if plastic ended up in the wrong place in nature without um, being taken care of, it causes um, a very sensational emotion that this is a big polluting source. So can we do something about it? Um, can we just, just not use any plastics? Perhaps it's very hard. Let me rephrase that question. Um, can we live without plastic for a day? I cannot see the screen, but if you think you can live without plastic for a day, could you raise your hand just to put a hand? Move you here. Quite some also, people. <laughs> a few people have raised their hands, about five or six. Very good. So you are not alone. Yeah. Uh, yes. <coughs> a journalist from New York Times, um, he wrote an article a few weeks ago. He tried to survive without plastic for 24 hours. It's a funny article to read. So he tried to use um, um, a toothbrush, a wooden toothbrush with boar hair, and he tried to use sort of medieval um, uh, ingredient for deodorant. Um, he also tried to figure out which trousers he has as is actually really 100% cotton, and he couldn't find it because even a trousers that labeled 100% cotton, there is some polyester in it. 
And he also tried um, and asked the family to help him to open the door because the doorknob is coated. And this picture I found hilarious. He has to take public transportation, but it's plastics everywhere. So he took his own wooden chair and he did his best. And by the end of the day, he counted 164 violations. It seems very difficult to avoid plastics. So if we can't avoid, what now? I think we still need to put effort in reuse, refuse, and to reduce demand, therefore reduce the waste. But we can also think about make, make better plastics, which is more of my topic. So the topic here is really make a better plastic. What do we mean by better, right? I would say this is just part of the puzzle pieces. Um, so alternative carbon sources um, means that we take we take biogenic carbon or other carbon sources that is non-fossil fuel origin and to make plastic with a lower environmental impact. Or another option to recycle, even better, recycle the biogenic carbon and to go for an aim of a circular biobase. So if we can take the biogenic carbon and keep it in the technosphere and keep recycling that, um, would that be another ideal case that we can imagine as a solution, one of the solutions? So here I want to bring your attention to two cases that we worked in the past and also just uh, finalized. Uh, I will go through this, these cases um, as today's agenda. So the first question is, are bio-based plastics a solution? Before we come to that, first is what is bioplastic? I, I don't know your background. I, if you already know, you can take a break. <laughs> so bioplastics, there are two dimensions of that. One dimension is the bio-based. We discussed so the alternative carbon sources instead of fossil fuel, we use, um, we use the plant-based. Another dimension is called the biodegradable and don't mix them up together. So biodegradable is not that straightforward in the black and white definition, but for simplification, we, 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 we um, classified it as yes or no by certifi uh, certified biodegradable. And we need to be aware that biodegradability and has a different, uh, of a plastic has a different, um, you, you need to set up a different condition. So it has to do with the temperature, has to do with um, the moisture, has to do with the duration you allow a material to degrade. So it's not a simple yes or no question, but let's put it simple as such. If it's certified biodegradable, let's say it's yes, if not, a no. And on the bio-based axis, we can categorize a material into three groups. In either they are fully um, bio-based, for example, um, polylactic acid. Today you can find them in the market. Um, a lot of single-used items are made from um, polylactic acid today. And the, uh, the booming application of PLA is a 3D printing. So this little bird is printed by my son. It's very pretty. And there's also starch plastics is in a large volume available in the market. And so these are thermoplastic thermo starch that is modified, um, usually also blended with um, petrochemical plastics to increase the property. And then we also have a category that is the fully bio-based, but they are not biodegradable. Um, so th these are the so-called drop-in um, polymers, drop-in chemicals. So the PE and the PP here in this category they are chemically identical with the petrochemical polyolefins. They will not degrade in the ocean. <laughs> so they, they are the only difference is the, the carbon source. Uh, the chemical structure is, is identical. And then we also have um, partially bio-based. For example, the PET bottles, you will find that a, a part of the PET bottle, PET, the the, one of the ingredients in the polymer, they can be made from bio-based resource and the, the, the other part, the tephthalic acid, is still made today in a commercial scale uh, from petrochemical resources. And then the, there is a confusing part. And then we also have a category of polymers. They are made from fossil fuels, but they are made biodegradable. 
So these are fossil fuel based biodegradable plastics and often they are used to, to blend with, for example, starch plastics to increase the mechanical property. And the last category, of course, that's the common plastic we know. These are non um, biodegradable, they are from fossil fuel based. So the, the definition of bioplastics is essentially everything that is biodegradable or bio-based. So everything here except for the, the, the non-biodegradable and fossil fuel based the conventional plastics. This is a very confusing. Um, so if somebody asks you, is bioplastic good or bad? No, the question should be which one you're talking about, because it's a big spectrum of different material, different polymers involved. So my research here is focused strongly on bio-based. You know, they can be biodegradable or not, both. The volume is of these bioplastics, so bio-based on this side and the biodegradable, but fossil fuel based on this side, the volume in total of these so-called bioplastics, um, it's about 2 million tons, a bit more than 2 million tons. And I remember that in a few slides before, in 1950s, the petrochemical plastics also had this 2 million tons annual capacity of production. So are we going to take it, take it over? Um, following the path of fossil fuel industry, or yeah, or I, can we do it in a in a different way? Or can we do it in a low impact, more sustainable way? So the question here, of course, there's a lot of study in the LCA field, um, a lot of review study, a lot of LCA has done on the, in this field. What we generally know, and a very short a few sentences to to cover that so we did review also similar review as other literature compared to the petrochemical counterparts and these um, classical lca of these uh, innovative bio-based plastics show that um, often these bio-based alternatives have a lower cradle to gate greenhouse gas emissions if the biogenic carbon removal are accounted as a direct credit for example, as the way past 2050 would define it. Although we also found out that the biochemical conversion process itself can be quite energy intensive, therefore carbon intensive, um, because most biogenic process, so bio-based process involve a lot of water. So for example, the fermentation process is the downstream separation needs to remove a lot of water from the system. And then that can be very, heat intensive and if the heat comes from natural gas or other fossil fuel then it can be the whole process can look very carbon intensive and there's very um, the whole system analysis of LCA could be very vulnerable and very sensitive to the choice of allocation and multifunctionality so this is a, like the top um, three conclusions that we know from the classical LCAs the bio-based system often leads to a higher impact on land and water. This is not often reported um, in LCA studies, so the trade-offs needs to be better understood in a sense. So what did we what we did not learn from these classical LCAs as we reviewed are the environmental impacts um, if we include indirect land use change. If these impact, the effect of indirect land use change are accounted for, um, can we still claim a lower greenhouse gas emission compared to the petrochemical counterparts? And most LCA stop at, at gate because many LCA are aimed for assisting innovation and product and process development. Then if we include the end of life impacts included in the LCA, can we still draw the same conclusion? I think these are the two important um, aspects if we want to do another LCA, right? So a couple of years ago, uh, the European Commission asked this question. They asked for LCA studies to, to provide science-based evidence to support policies, especially policies around bio-based products. Uh, since it's rather complicated, they ask for help from scientists. 
and the, the study they commissioned, they asked for um, a, the LCA should be able to identify the environmental hotspots, the concerns and of the innovative bio-based plastics. And we should also compare these impacts with the fossil fuel counterparts. So they the, this whole study basically excluded the conventional bio-based bio products such as paper and pulp and textile as such. So only the innovative ones are, in, are included. So we had a long list of candidate products for, for the commission to choose. There are criteria, sub-criteria, there are processes of choosing, and eventually we come up with seven cases that is selected. So these are the beverage bottles, uh, horticulture clips, single-use drinking cups, and carrier bags, and packaging film, cutlery, and mulch film. If you take a moment to look at all seven cases, these are all single use items. <laughs> so that eventually surprised me a bit. Um, seems like we are looking, sort of looking for alternatives uh, for these single use items. And we are doing LCA to see whether these are better alternatives. Keep that in mind. We'll come back to this point uh, later. And we use, the, we use LCA, of course, and you all know LCA, so I'm not going to explain that. It, it's, it looks very straightforward, of course. Um, if you if you just just follow all the steps, you can do LCA. But of course, in reality, um, it's like this when you do LCA. It's all the flows are linked. Um, you can go as detailed as you you want, and then the go flow goes back. There's loops. So anyway, we need a structure. So what we did at the time is we uh, followed. Uh, at the time, it's called product environmental footprint category rules. At the time, uh, we we try to follow that as a guidance. Um, this is a, a cradle to grief LCA. Uh, it's um, um, geographic scope is that all these bio-based bio products are sold, consumed and disposed of in Europe, whereas the supply chain can go globally. So we only look at the established technologies uh, in this case, and the, the temporal scope is status quo at the time is 2018, taking very near future in, into consideration. We took all 16 impact categories that is um, defined by, say, the EF method, selected by the EF method um, by the GRC. And we also did the normalization and weighting. So eventually we got LCA as so-called a single score. So you stack all these impact category together as one score and compare uh, the overall impact across different options. Uh, what we did a little beyond uh, what the PFCR asked for is we include, try to include effects on end use change. And this part of the work is actually done by Laurie Hamling. What I want to say is this whole project, I didn't do this on my own. <laughs> so there's a team, entire team behind it. Um, so the, the overview of the case studies, um, it looks like there are seven products, but there are actually there's three types of polymers involved. It's the PET, PLA, and the starch plastics. Um, the, these are commercialized this, at the moment that is commercialized available on a large scale. Um, so these are the polymers. What we can see that what they are replacing in the, for the petrochemical counterparts, so PET replaces PT, that's a straightforward as a drop in. Whereas you see the PLA actually replace various types of petrochemical counterparts from polyester to polyolefin, um, polypropylene to polystyrene. So there is a range. It's not entirely, you can see that one-to-one. -one. So functionally still replacing, but yeah, so it's a big range that the technical substitution is, it, it, it varies. The same goes for starch plastics, but starch more, they're more focusing on displacing um, PE and the PP. For, for in this study, so we looked at the status quo average technology mix in this and at the time the study was conducted, we did manage to uh, obtain quite some data from industry, especially from cradle to factory gate phase. As I said, end of life is a challenging 
phase. And so how did we do that? The, the problem is, yes, these products are available on the market um, on a relatively large scale compared to, to, to the other more niche product, but you don't really see them in the waste stream. They are still so small compared to the amount of waste that we generate. And so we take we take sort of two level approach in in this bio esprit project. The first approach that we imagine these single use the bio based products will just ended up in the current waste infrastructure. Um, maybe sometimes they get better treated as desired. For example, uh, single use cups made from POA. Um, most likely they will end it up in waste incineration or landfill. Occasionally, they will also end up in composting and recycling part. Um, so that's so-called average EU mix as one scenario for all the different types. And then we also have another scenario we call that intended end of life. So this is a very de desired, very optimistic scenario that these polymers and this plastic will end up in a place we want them to end up. Um, so th this is a, an, an, a, a best case scenario, you can call that. And so, for example, bottles will always go to recycling, whereas um, PLA waste will go to recycling and composting. What we think that there is little data you really can collect as evidence. So the truth could be just between these two scenarios. So let's see how this will affect our LCA result. And then we included land use change also. Um, so the direct land use change model is conducted according to the PFCR. And then we also use the indirect land use change model that is developed by Lori Hamlin um, to use a deterministic model to, that is adapted for this study. So how did we model the indirect land use change? So this is a, again, a slide borrowed from Lori. Um, First, we need to know if we add a pressure on additional land demand, how um, this whole market will react, right? So we need to establish a plausible cause effect chain events, understanding how the services and products were displayed and react in terms of demand and supply. Once you know that, you could determine whether the additional land demand will go to expansion or actually we don't need to expand, we just to intensify the agricultural practice to increase the yield. And the, the ratio between expansion and intensification, you can find it in historical time series data from the, from the FAO. And use that information, you can calculate impact resulted from expansion and also impact resulted from intensification. If you put them together, you get your impact of indirect land use change. So this is a still quite a generic approach on the top level, right? Uh, we'll come back to that letter later, but this is nevertheless, we need to give a try on how, how indirect land use impact can affect the whole value chain for bio-based plastics. And here is the result. <laughs> Don't be scared, it's late, I know. <laughs> I'll try to help you to navigate through uh, what we find out, so on the on the bottom on the x-axis, uh, you will find this all these bio-based products, these items. On the y-axis, uh, these are impact normalized to 100. Um, so you what you compare is for each option, you compare a scenario with average end-of-life waste treatment and the desired intended end-of-life waste treatment. And the LCA result is the breakdown into different life cycle and stages. What we want to draw your attention, the first is the green bars across different options. What you find out the most, most um, bio-based products has relatively low impact on in terms of biomass production, um, except for beverage bottles. And why is that? Why the biomass production has a high impact? This is so. This is an aggregated uh, single sort of single score with normalized and weighted results. Uh, what happened there is pre 2020 um, in Brazil, 
So where the sugar can come from for the ethylene glycol that will be put it in the bottle. Um, and the sugar cane cultivation uh, practice there, the agricultural practice there is to burn um, the, the residue of sugar cane after harvesting. So it's open air burning that resulted in uh, huge air pollution. And that actually leads to the higher impact here for the biomass, uh, the biomass production for the beverage bottles. Although, you know, the ethylene glycol is just a very small part for the bottle, it's about less than one third. So even though the impact is quite a substantial here, what we see, and after 2020, so there is a law in Brazil that this practice needs to be abandoned. Uh, it should be forbidden. So if someone is going to do LCA again, the number and impact would definitely change. This is the first thing I want to draw your attention. The second is what you notice is the brown bars around across all yeah. ocean. This is a very large contributor. And this is the polymer and the material production. So the, the really the processing and the chemical conversion to turn biomass into something you know useful and high performance sometimes. So this is a lot of effort. It seems like um, um, many, uh, it's quite energy and uh, it's, it's related to the energy and, and process heat and electricity production. Um, this is a, still very, very big. Another source is some of the polymers, uh, for example, the beverage bottle, the PET bottle, contains still two thirds of the of the component is still terephthalic acid. Those are fossil fuel based um, monomer, and some other pro product like starch plastics, as I mentioned before, the starch plastics is actually a blend between modified thermostatic uh, thermoplastic starch and petrochemical based. Um, biodegradable plastics. So there is still petrochemical plastics in the material. That That's another reason that the polymer and material production has a relatively high impact. And the third highlight from this sheet is um, the uncertainties between the two waste management scenarios. So you see that actually leads to quite a substantial differences um, between the two, between the average that we imagine that the, the, the bio-based item will end up in the current waste management system and the desired. So this this what you see is there's a huge room for improvement. Um, and of course, the next question is how to get there, right? So we compare with the petrochemical polymers. If we compare that, we cannot, um, we didn't manage to compare with all 16 impact categories because the the data transparency for the petrochemical polymers was not sufficient enough to to really draw meaningful interpretation um, from their LCA but we managed to pick five of those that we are confident that we can we can use the data at the same um, more symmetric way that we can we can compare those with the bio-based um, product systems. So here, what, what I want to show you is the cradle to grave, the so-called baseline results, excluding the land use change effects. Um, what we found out is in terms of climate change and fossil fuel depletion, and clearly these bio-based options offers a lower impact from cradle to grave. Um, nearly all options pointed out a lower impact in this case except for one, I, I, if I remember clearly. And in terms of particulate matter, uh, nearly all option pointed at a higher impact. And for the case of um, PET bottle, that is, that is very substantial. And that is the reason of this 600% here in the, on the table. And so that's clear pointed out that, yes, there is a trade-off if we want to go for mit mitigate climate change, we need to understand that the trade-off of bio-based system could lead to a higher particulate matter impact. And for the other two, um, the photochemical ozone formation and terrestrial eco eutrophication, it's rather case specific. So there is the number is in essentially all over the place. There's not clear, no clear conclusion that we can draw. Um, so we 
there is a trade-off, but we do need to look at case by case, and each case has a different characteristics and reason why the impact is higher or lower. So this is um, this study. Um, so far, we looked only at so-called a bit, still a bit on the classical LCA side, right? In the land use change model, uh, what we found out is the land use change will actually lead to a marginal increase in impact, about 14% increase for climate change, 10% for photochemical ozone formation, and for other impact categories, the increase is really minor, very small. Um, what I learned is this is a slight, not slightly, actually quite different experience when we discuss biofuel, whereas land use change has a very high impact. Um, what I understand here that if the shorter, if the production chain is very short, like a biofuel, then the land use change effect is much stronger. It just appears to be stronger because if, if ethanol is simply burned. But if you use the ethanol, put it in, in the chemical processes to make ethylene and eventually uh, making ethylene glycol and eventually goes into uh, polyethylene production, and then the effect becomes appears to, to be a smaller share into the over, overall life cycle of, for example, PET bottle. And, and still, you know, we know that land use change has a strong impact on um, from the experience of biofuel assessment. Um, still with, with PET, you can see that this effect is, is still not compare with the fossil fuel that is put into the polymer, like the impact that's dominated there by the use of terephthalic acid in the sample of uh, PET uh, bottle. I hope this is a clear, <laughs> quite complicated to explain this. Um, but land use impact is actually more complex than what I understand the current uh, life cycle impact assessment model can offer. Uh, especially the impact of this carbon removal if there's land use change occurs it's, uh, for the perennial, perennial crops and the broody biomass. So land use and land use change actually will disturb the carbon balances, not, not, because, not only because that we change the type of biomass on the land and the usage of land, but also there's indirect you know, land, uh, carbon balances like a soil organic carbon content will also be changed and related the nitrogen balance and the, how, how the soil are able to keep the balance, the available fresh water that soil can keep will also be different, and the, let alone uh, the very complex issue on biodiversity. So I feel that from a practitioner point of view, this spatial temporal explicit model is really urgently needed because you can't say generically a land use is good or bad, you need to look at the cases specifically, and we need to look at where the land use change will occur. You need to look at location closely and with a higher resolution. Then we will be able to say a bit more um, with a confidence about what land use change uh, can influence a bio-based production chain. Okay. And then I go back to my table of contents. I say the part of the puzzle is uh, to, to practice also the recycling, right? What about recycling? We talk about biogenic carbon so far. Um, in terms of recycling, um, before we go into the whole LCA case study again, um, I want to show you this figure. This is um, um, an MFA, so material flow analysis um, of the Dutch waste flows. <laughs> um, we, we try to look for the literature actually for the global sort of similar waste flows. It was really difficult to find, so we decided uh, we start to do it um, for the Dutch case. Uh, what we found out is uh, domestic, so that every year we generate about 2 million, 2 million um, plastic waste from all sectors. Um, domestic generated account for 70 percent and the imported is 30%. Um, over 40% of all these 2 million um, tons of plastics were actually sent to the recycling, which um, a, a large part is sent, uh, recycled within the Netherlands, and um, also a small part actually is sent outside of the Netherlands for recycling. And 40% is 
a rather high number compared to um, a global average um, plastic that is eventually recycled. And remember that. And about 30% is about 570 kiloton, uh, in this case, was incinerated with energy recovery. And this number is excluding the imported RDF. The RDF means refused derived fuel. So these are um, uh, these are actually imported under the name of fuels. <laughs> they are not under the name in the statistics, trade statistics as as plastic waste or plastic scrap. The Netherlands import every year more than a million ton from the UK, this RDF to burn in the incineration plant to recover energy and also help UK to treat <laughs> waste. The, essentially, it's a residue waste that is pre-treated uh, in the UK. Uh, some of the contaminant is removed, uh, the moisture is reduced and it's pelletized in the form of fuel. It's traded under the, under the category of fuel. So if we include that a million ton on top of this two million ton, about three million tons of plastic waste is actually landed in the Netherlands. And we also find out there are small amount of plastics is actually leaked um, either on the Dutch beaches or riverbanks, or we estimate could also leaked in the foreign environment because the Netherlands also um, export a large amount of uh, waste under the statistic uh, record. What I want to highlight for this whole picture is first of, first of all, the Netherlands is is a highly organized uh, country. Eh? So <laughs> a lot of things are registered, well documented. You can find many, many statistics. And even though it is really, really hard to close the mass balance. So you notice that we have here unreported large quantity. We have here um, unreported destination on the large quantity. We can't identify where they go. Um, the second thing I want to highlight is this 40% recycling rate. It is really high. And a large part of this 40% actually attribute to one type of polymer. So this, this is a 40% recycling. We're still talking about a lot about mechanical recycling. And this one polymer that stands out, this is a PET. Again, we go back to the bottles. <laughs> In Europe, PET is the most recycled polymer of all other um, polymers. The most reused polymer is polyolefin, but PET is the most recycled. Um, so we somebody estimated here about 25% of the entire PET market demand can be is already met by uh, recycled PET in EU27 plus UK. So if you think about all plastic demand in Europe, that's about 50 million tons per year, and the number is still increasing slowly. Um, currently, about four to five percent, or four to five million tons, can be met by, say, recycled and so plastic recyclers. This is about eight to ten percent in total, and PT is is 25 percent. So it's really a high recycling, and it's going uh, going very fast without so much political incentives. Um, it just happened. The market just took it over. How how does how does this happen? So why is PET so successful? I was thinking about it. I think first of all there is a very well established um, deposit system, a deposit return system in many European countries. It has a very high collection rate. So the Netherlands is one of those countries has sort of semi deposit return systems. Um, about sixty five percent collection rate is reached for the Netherlands and some other countries very high, for example, in Denmark, um, the collection rate can go up to 96%. And the PET is also very interesting polymer. It's heavier. It's heavier than water. It means that you can use a rel relatively cheap method to separate, separate it from polyolefin, which is usually lighter than water. Um, and and we also observed improved the packaging design in the last century or last decades. Sorry. And so in, in say ten years ago, I still see those um, water bottled in 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 red bottles, in green bottles, in blue bottles for different sparkling levels, right? 
and they all disappeared, right? They all become clear bottle and you just put a paper label around it and the, the weight is also reduced. So you see that this improved design also promotes that easy, easy, uh, to, easy to facilitate the recycling of PET. And then it's a polyester. I found this fascinating. With a polyester, it's so much easier if you one at a certain point when the mechanical recycling you know reached to it to its limit you can easily do a chemical recycling you can depolymerize into two right um two monomers and then repolymerize again so there are many options around recycling of pet i think that makes the whole polymer very interesting so where do i bring you to this point <laughs> because i want to bring you to the attention to pef so one of the bio-based alternatives of PT is PF. PF is a polyethylene furanoid. It looks like this. Um, it looks a lot like PT instead of the C6 ring. It has a C5 ring here. I don't want to scare you with the flow sheet and don't, do not read in detail. I will highlight and help, help you to, to navigate this through. So PF is it's a sugar-based polymer. It is, um, it's nearly commercialized in large scale. Uh, first, the commercial production perhaps will happen in 2024. It is a very similar to PET, and in some cases, like a gas barrier property is sometimes even better. So the oxygen barrier property, for example, is nearly 10 times better than, than PET. And it can be recycled in a very similar way as PET. Um, there are LCA published about PEF, um, but those are mostly based on process design data. So it's a lot, a lot often that you find those a stop at a factory gate. But even though we found out that's about a literature report about 30 to 40 percent reduction depends on the scope. Um, what we don't really know is um, if we want to put a new type of polymer into a circular economy in the future. So it means that we also need to recycle. We do mechanical recycling at a certain point. We can't mechanical recycle anymore because polymer degradate. Um, then we, we can apply chemical recycling. So the, there's a little know about the differences in terms of LCA between the mechanical and the chemical recycling. And we also wanted to know that's recycling PEF actually essentially offers environmental benefit at all. Maybe the effort is so much, the trade-off is so much, we don't know. Um, and the third question is just my curiosity is how the whole circular uh, concept, uh, how circularity is assessed and how can it be reflected by LCA for bio-based plastics if we want to multi apply the multiple recycling trips for such a, for such a polymer? So we did LCA together with Paul Stegman, who recently defended his PhD thesis. So this is a sort of still forthcoming article. Um, <laughs> another uh, Dr. complicated. Chen, really sorry, we've got less than ten minutes left. Oh, sorry, I will, I will run this through quickly. Okay. So okay, what we you. found out is um, we did a, a few cases. So it's with uh, with mechanical recycling in the blue dot and orange and dot will be the chemical recycling. What you find out first is that the size of the dots are so-called material utility, means that how much material still remained in the product if you do multiple recycling trips. Um, and you see the chemical recycling can retain this very long. So the circularity, if we use this index, will be sort of still quite high, right? But if you look at environmental impact in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, um, mechanical recycling clearly offers a, a better option, a better performance. So what we learned here is circularity does not always lead to sustainability. And this needs to be carefully examined by other many other case studies. And I think this needs to be also kept, kept, kept in mind when we talk about, discuss about circularity and what is the ultimate goal of circular economy. I will skip this one. I um, want to reflect a few on, on what we know. So I think it's, it's first of all to align both circular circularity performance and environmental sustainability. I think it's important for, for a practitioner. And we also need to think about what do we do when 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 we evaluate uh, impact on on circular 
production. So if the if we use waste as input, means that the classical cradle and the classical um, grave it becomes the border becomes blurred. And I think um, to apply consequential LCA, it's it's really urgently needed to understand the full picture of the implications. And the second part I want to draw your attention is this littered impact. And there's still so little know about how um, how ec ecosystem will react to this litter. Um, there are fundamental understanding on the environmental science, on the fates of on air, soil, water, and in the ocean. So how microplastic and nanoplastic will behave, how will they travel, where will they end up, and the impacts of plastic additives are still very worrying. So I think it's a so far it's still a very technocentric view. Don't forget about reuse and refuse, um, reduce demands. And I think we we should also keep reflecting on that. This is another important option to really solve um, the, the problem, the, the problematic issues of plastics in our in our economy. And last on my LCA, so this is a summarized slide that we know that um, we can do LCA, we can draw this flow sheet. Uh, for the bio-based system, do we really understand well, right, the land and uh, land use change issue? And can we really model well the circular use of the of the plastics and the material in our life? And the last, this is a picture of um, a polylactic acid cup that is uh, taken from our university canteen. Think about if we use it and throw it away. There are three bins, one for plastic, one for organic waste. It goes to composting side. The other one is the residue waste. Where would you throw it? That's all my uh, all I, I wanted to say. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Li Shen. I've now opened the floor to questions. Now, so my colleague Paisan will be uh, going through the Q&A. So, uh, Paisan, do you want to get started? Sure. Th thank you so much, Dr. Lee. So the first question we have from um, Erwin uh, asking, how can you use the Biosprit project EU normalization and weighting factors for something produced in the midways of the US? So that's the first question. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So the part of, yeah, there are some POA actually come from US and the um, impact assessment model it is uh, it is not restricted to the impact within the US, if I understand correctly, or this impact like a climate change is addressed at the global level. So these are the impact category, all 16 is actually picked, uh, assembled by the European Commission that they had a view on these are the 16 impact category that is highly relevant from the European context. But in impact assessment models like toxicity and eutrophication, these are global model. Thank you. And the second question from Erwin as well. Um, where is the evidence that indirect land use change happens for PLA from US corn? Um, as I said, so this is not very um, site specific. We do look at the corn production in the US and go as closely as possible to the um, say to the original where the biomass come from. But eventually the model goes with um, the cause effect chain of of um, if the additional demand of POA increased the pressure of land use and how it would respond and to intensification and expansion is actually that takes from historical data from the FAO. Of course, that's not a prediction in the future. So that's why it's a deterministic, uh, deterministic model, which has its own limitation. And I, I can imagine um, that's also what I feel like it's urgent that as a practitioner, we need a spatial explicit and temporal explicit model very soon to be able to answer better this kind of question. But nevertheless, we do need to give a try because the indirect land use change is happening and it's been recognized. It's happening. There's just how to assess that. It's not that straightforward. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, the next question from Laura. Does the CO2 embedded in bioplastics need to be accounted for or should it be considered neutral in LCA? Um, 
Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. As I said, the carbon removal is it's a topic. So in the BioSpree bio project, we did consider that we take the biogenic carbon as a as sort of credit as a removal. But if it's emitted at end of life, it's fully oxidized, then it will emit it again. So it, it does cancel that out. But what I mentioned that the temporal temporal specific model is important because the, there is a timing issue. If it's annual crop, then yeah, there's a short CO2 cycle, short carbon cycle. But if we're talking about woody biomass, it takes longer time for the for the trees or for the biomass to to sequest CO2 from atmosphere. The removal takes longer. Then we also need to count for how long we can keep that carbon in the atmosphere or in the technosphere. So th that temporal dynamic is currently not included in, in most of the LCA. And it's not that the practitioner doesn't want to do it. It's just that it, you, there's not enough data and information. If you look at removal, you need to look at a specific crop in a specific region. You need to understand specific land use and land use change pattern. And then with with um, with the carbon that stay in technosphere, you also need to make a sort of assumption for a new product, how long this product going to stay and how end of life could be imagined. So that's that's the challenge still. Uh, I hope Python, this... we have time for two more questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, the, the next question uh, from Erwin, if one grows crop for 200 years on the same land, should the land use change factor not just be zero? Well, the, yeah, you can set a time frame. Uh, so the IPCC recommended if it's 20 years, usually, and that's the time that you look back. Um, what I understand is 20 years is the time for nature to reestablish the equilibrium for carbon stock. So if it's 200 years, indeed, then there's there's nothing much um, change. There's no land use change if you keep keep growing the same crop. 